since liberating and freeing his beloved children. The people whom he called my treasured possession. Jehovah God has been calling his children to live by faith and not by fear. To keep their eyes on him, to keep moving forward, to not live in the past or be stuck there in the past, but to keep moving forward and to love him with all of their heart, soul, strength, and mind as he leads them to himself and to a better land of promise. A land where they will live out their faith doing justly, loving mercy, and walking humbly with their God. A land where they will choose to join Jehovah in the work that he is doing, to show forth the praises of him who's called them out of darkness into his marvelous light, so that they will be able to minister to a fallen world around them, and God will be glorified. For the past 10 months, we've been studying lessons that parallel what many of us are reading at home, where we're looking for God and what he's like and how he works and what his will is for us as we join him in the work that he's doing to draw all men to himself. Today, we come to the last book in the Old Testament, which will be God's final call to his people. After this final call, Jehovah will be silent for the next 400 years until he chooses on his timetable 400 years later to send the next prophet to try to open their eyes and point them to Jesus, to the one they'll be asked to embrace and receive the Savior, and the Lord. I know that this morning I'm one week ahead of our reading schedule, but I want to jump ahead one week because next Sunday is the day when we will annually recognize all the precious babies that have been born into our family during this past year. And rather than preach next Sunday on Malachi, I thought that it might be better to preach next week on families and children. When I came here, I was told that we annually have our Baby's Day the first Sunday of October a few years ago. For whatever reason, I had brain lock. They, all the preparations were made in the office right around me, but somehow it didn't register with me until I walked in. And I saw Ken at the back, and I saw this, felt this buzz. I saw all the Bibles we were about to give those children, and I had planned to preach that day on anger management. <laughs> I went ahead and did that and felt about that big. And afterwards, I can't tell you the number of teenage parents who said it was very appropriate for us, Frank. I don't ever intend to do that again. So today we're going to jump ahead a week and we're going to study what God has to say through the prophet Malachi. Here's the context of our lesson and let's open our Bibles there together. For 120 years, God's kingdom people were united under his lordship and under the leadership of three men who sat on the throne in Israel. But when King Solomon died, Evil men cared more, cared more about being king than they did about serving the kingdom. And that's sad. And therefore, the kingdom divided. Over the next 400 years, both kingdoms struggled because they had not given their hearts wholly to the Lord and wouldn't put aside their differences and walk, work humbly together to advance the cause, the greater cause of the kingdom. Over time, both kingdoms fell because they didn't take to heart the word of God and the words of the prophets whom God rose up and delivered to them to give a message from him about what his will was for them. After years of vanity and pride and no godly king leading them, 
The northern kingdom fell to the Assyrians, and eventually they'll simply be wiped out and will cease to exist as a nation. That's sad and tragic. The southern kingdom will do a little better. They'll have a few godly kings, but morally and in terms of unity, that kingdom will be a roller coaster ride, and eventually, too, they will fall. Babylon will come into the land of promise and take them captive. Babylon will come in and destroy their land. And God's people will be taken down to Babylon and there, there they will be brainwashed and encouraged to live like the pagans. They'll be in captivity for 70 years. But because Jehovah God is a gracious and covenant-keeping God, He eventually allows His children from the southern kingdom to return to their homeland. And when they come back, they're called, just like we are called, to be a blessing. In anticipation of our last building project here at Cross Point, we appropriately chose to name that new wing behind us, the Nehemiah Project. And during that time, we studied the book of Nehemiah, the man who served as a trusted cupbearer to the Babylonian king. While he was in captivity, God worked on the heart of that pagan king, and God worked through the actions of that pagan king. And that pagan king allowed any captive in Babylon to return to their homeland if he or she wanted to go. Nehemiah, the cupbearer to the king, heard about how desolate his homeland was and how his people who lived there were in great trouble and distress. So Nehemiah cry, cried over them, and he prayed over them. And he goes to the king and he asks for permission and for the king's blessing to return to his homeland and serve her, which he did. Nehemiah surveyed the desolation of Jerusalem, prayed over her, and then gathered all the congregation together and said, come, let us rebuild the walls of Jerusalem against much negativity and criticism. The task was accomplished in 52 days, and a spiritual revival took place in the lives of God's people that permeated through the congregation that ultimately brought a revival throughout the land. The Bible says in Nehemiah 9, the joy of the Lord returned, and God's people renewed their vows to Him. What were those vows to do justly, love mercy, and walk humbly with their God to help the poor? So they started bringing their tithes to the storehouse. They started bringing the first fruits of all of their crops and how they had been blessed. And the Bible says at the end of the book of Nehemiah, all of Israel contributed. Even though things have been tough for them in the past, this spiritual revival led by Nehemiah lit a fire within God's people. And they saw things that needed to be done and being proactive, they chose to step up and make a difference and make life better for others, which in turn made life better for themselves. But then Nehemiah left Jerusalem for a period of time some Bible scholars say he was gone as much as 12 years, and when he came back, he was stunned by what he saw. The magnificent house of God was neglected and run down. People, these are his people, were caught up in sin. They were selfish, and they were focused upon themselves. He found that his people were not generous. 
Many of them had become cynical. Others of them had become apathetic. Those who were worshiping were bored. And they were just going through the motions in worship. And families and marriages were falling apart. I want you to look closely at that list. Look at it closely on the screen. Today many preachers and many people compare what happened in Israel to what is happening today in America. And we can all see many similarities. But since you're the people of God, I want to ask you to listen very, very carefully. Biblically, Israel is never compared to America. Let me ask you, if we are consistent with biblical theology, who would Israel most represent today? I hope you've got the answer in your brain. Listen, it is the church. That does not mean that we're not concerned about America. We love America. I love America. I am praying for revival to sweep through America, but if it is going to, it's going to have to begin with the people of God. I believe with all of my heart that our prayer should be 2 Chronicles 7, 14. But America is not God's kingdom people. We as the church are God's kingdom people. Now, do this for me. Look at the list on the screen again. And look at it in terms of the church, not in terms of America. Look at it now. In terms of the church. Do you think that it is possible for some congregations or for people in this congregation to be like those characteristics there? Do you think it's possible for God's people sitting in worship to be selfish and focused on themselves? Do you think it's possible for God's people to not be generous? Do you think it's possible for God's people to be sitting here in His presence and be cynical about what's going on? Do you think it's possible for others to be here today and be apathetic toward anything? Do you think it's possible for people to just come to worship and come into the presence of God and be bored? And do you think it's possible for families to be falling apart left and right? That's what Nehemiah saw when he went back after having left. And it broke his heart. And he steps up then. Instead of just crying, woe is me, he steps up to do something about it. And we thank God that there was another prophet who stepped up to help him. His name was Malachi. And that's the man that we'll study about this morning. His task is to be a spokesman for God. Trying to touch the hearts of people like that. He's going to try to light a fire within them that will bring about spiritual renewal and revival in the congregation. Let me tell you a little bit about him. We know from chapter 3, verse 1, that his name means my messenger. As the messenger and spokesman for God, he's going to issue one final call to God's children. Two, in the words of Jehovah God, return to me. Return to me, return to my heart, and I will return to you, God says. One writer said Malachi's task was to light and rekindle the lamp of faith and fire in the hearts of disheartened people. And he tries to do it in a very unique way. Malachi had a unique style of preaching and teaching. Listen closely. His method was one of questions and answers. As a former teacher and now as a preacher, I've always been fascinated by different styles of both preaching and teaching. And there are many ways to get the point across. 
We studied how Ezekiel was to be an object lesson. Hosea, an object lesson. Many people learn best by seeing. Jeremiah, on the other hand, I can hear him crying as he preaches his heart out with tears streaming down his face. The harvest is past, the summer's ended, and we're not saved. And here comes a preacher who's going to dialogue with God's people. He's going to ask the question that comes from God, and the people are going to respond then to his question. It's a great way to get people to think. So let's look at how it goes. Jehovah God, the great I am, the loving, gracious, creative, saving God, will make this statement. He'll make a statement through Malachi, and then God's people will cynically respond, and they'll fire a question back to God. For instance, the book begins in verse 2 of chapter 1 with this statement from God to his people who've gotten off track. God says to them, I love you. I've always loved you. And instead of humbly saying, thank you, Lord, what did they say and how did they respond? They say to God, how have you loved us? Show us proof. Can you ma imagine the audacity of asking God to prove his love? All they have to do is look around. All they have to do is look at their life. All they have to do is look up. Look in verse 6, God responds to them, A son honors his father, and if I'm your father, where's the honor that's due me? Where's the respect due to me? But what is their response back to the one whom all the angelic host continually bows down to and worships and acknowledge with both their life and their lips that he's worthy of all honor, glory, praise, and respect? God's people say back to that God, how have we shown contempt for your name? It's almost as if they are oblivious to the way they're living, to where their hearts are, to what their attitude is like. They say, how have we shown contempt for your name? And God responds, you place defiled food on my altar. God's always wanted his children to be generous like he is, the Bible says that our God loves a cheerful giver. David once said he was not ever going to give anything to the Lord that didn't cost him something. Paul told the young preacher Timothy to teach the church in Ephesus to be generous and willing to share, not only so that the needy could be helped, but Paul said in that way you'll be laying up for yourself treasures as a firm foundation in the coming age, and in the meantime, you'll experience what Paul says is real life. It's really living. What's really living is being generous and willing to share and being a blessing to those around you in the name of God and pointing them to God. That's what Paul says. And God is trying to get across the same thing through his prophet Malachi to these people. He's trying to get them to give run right off the top of their blessings to God and to help other people. But here, his people are just going through the motions. They're giving God the leftovers and the things they don't want for themselves. And they say to God, how have we defiled you? They just don't get it. Turn with me to chapter 2 and look at verse 8. God, through Malachi, is specifically talking here to the priest to the people of God, to the men who are intercessors. And he says to them, you guys are supposed to be the spiritual leaders and setting the example, and you're supposed to be speaking and living for me and teaching and modeling before me to the people how to walk humbly and live for me. But you violated the covenant I made with Levi, and you're not modeling and doing what I put you here to do. And how do the priest respond? They say, don't we all have one father, and aren't we all your children? 
Why do we profane the covenant of our fathers by breaking faith with another? Did you catch that? They thought that being God's children was good enough. Just being able to claim the fact that they're children of God and in a spiritual lineage, but God wanted so much more for His people. He's always wanted our hearts. He's always wanted our attitudes. And when He gets them both, there's no limit to what can be done in the kingdom, in the community, and throughout the country, in His name, by His kingdom people being what they're supposed to be and then doing what they're supposed to do. In verse 13, Malachi says to his people, here's another thing. You flood the Lord's altar with tears. You weep and wail because God no longer pays attention to your offering or accepts them with pleasure from your hands. And they say, why? And they start speculating on the root causes of why God's not pleased with the, they. They come and now they're crying. But why? Why isn't God's heart touched? And it's because of how they're living. And God says to them in verse 17, I hate divorce. Make sure you understand this. He doesn't say that he hates people. He doesn't say he hates the divorcee, but he hates all it does. He hates all the ripple effects that go with it. He hates the breaking of the covenant. He hates the breaking of the vows. He hates the breaking of hearts. He hates what it does to precious children. He hates what it does to family members who love both parties. And on and on I can go, can't I? And so God says, guard yourself. Look at it, verse 16. Guard yourself in your spirit and don't break the faith. Underline that verse in your Bible if you're going to underline one here. Or if you've underlined 17, underline 16 as well. Guard yourself in your spirit and don't break the faith. Malachi then follows that statement with this. You're just wearying the Lord with your words. It's easy to talk about our faith and what we believe. But Jesus... And the end of the Sermon on the Mount is asking us to put our faith into practice. And yet, instead of being touched, they fire another cynical question back to God and they say, how have we wearied you? So turn with me to chapter 3, which will be our text this morning. I'll try to do this quickly. Let's read. I, the Lord, do not change. So you, O descendants of Jacob, are you not destroyed? Ever since the time of your forefathers, you've turned away from my decrees and have not kept them. Return to me. Here's the point. Return to me and I'll return to you, says the Lord. But you asked, how are we to return? Will a man rob God? Yet you rob me. But you asked, how do we rob you? And God says, in tithes and offerings. You're under a curse, the whole nation of you, because you're robbing me. Bring the whole tithe into the storehouse, that there may be food in my house. Test me in this, says the Lord Almighty, and see if I'll not throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessings to you that you'll not have room enough to receive it. I know it's a powerful, familiar passage, but it is an incredible one, isn't it? It's been stated numerous times times. This is the only time in scripture where the one and only God of this universe says to his people, put me to the test and I promise you I'll pass it. I don't need your tithes or your offerings, he says. But I want, I want them. Because by giving them, by giving me your heart, by giving me your life, by giving me your best, your tithes and your offerings, by giving me your life, it'll strengthen your faith. It'll affect your heart. It'll reprioritize your life. It'll help you understand what's really important, that you're here to be a blessing. God says, I don't need what you're giving me to accomplish my will on this earth. And he doesn't, does he? 400 years later, who's he going to send? Jesus. 
He says, I don't need you to accomplish my will here on this earth, but I want to use you. I, I, I love you. I want you to surrender your heart and your life. Give me your pride. Give me your pocketbook. Give me anything that's holding you back. If you'll give it to me in simple faith and trust, then see if I won't throw open the windows of heaven. If I won't just kick them wide open and pour out my blessings upon you and you in your life and heart and family won't have room enough to receive them. And the same thing would be true of God's kingdom people collectively as the church, wouldn't it? Now, instead of being pricked in their hearts and saying, yes, Lord, we're going to put you on the throne of our hearts. And we're going to live this way. And whatever I've been cynical about and holding me back about and all of these other things, I'm just going to surrender it to you. They fire back and they say, you're upset about something? You're upset about how we're living and what we've said? What have we said to you? How do you think God felt at this point at the end of the book? I'm just asking here. I'm going to tell you, I don't think he's mad at this point. I don't think he's upset. I don't think his wrath is kindled. I think he's broken hearted. I believe he's broken hearted. And I'll tell you why. It's at the end of chapter 3. God holds on to the hope that there are some faithful people still living in the kingdom who get it. They've heard this lesson from Malachi, and they get together and they talk about it. Isn't that wonderful? It's wonderful when God's people do that. When they get together and talk about spiritual principles and kingdom living and, and things that are so much more important than what we typically talk about. And the faithful get together and they petition our gracious God to be merciful to them and God writes their names. The names of those who have committed to honor him and serve him. God writes their names on a scroll. Does that remind you of how this book we call the Bible ends? Their names are written in a book. They're kingdom people of God who've chosen to make a difference in the way they think, act, and react, and therefore step up to be a blessing. Here's our lesson this morning. This is the final call in the Old Testament for God's people to return back to him, to give him their hearts, to give him their lives, to give him their minds, their attitudes, their ties, their families, their marriages, to turn it all over to him and put him to the test and see if he will prove himself faithful. After this message, God will be silent for the next 400 years. But the good news is this, and it is how the book ends. At that point, when we open up the next pages of the Bible, and we come to what we call the New Testament, at that point, God's going to send another messenger, a spokesman, like all of these men, He'll be known as the baptizer. And Matthew says he'll prepare the way for another messenger and another message, and that's whom? That's Jesus. And he'll turn the hearts of the fathers to the children. Isn't that a blessing? And he'll turn the hearts of the children to the fathers much like Elijah tried to do long ago, much like Nehemiah and Malachi have tried to do. If your life is not where it needs to be, if your heart or attitude is like those that we 
looked at on that list. If you've wandered far away from God or from home, we're going to sing this song that ties in to the plea of God through Malachi, return to me, and we'll say to God, Lord, I'm coming home. And with outstretched arms, the father of Luke 15, or the same father that's portrayed here in this book, with outstretched arms will embrace you coming home. Just give him a chance. See if he'll bless you. See what he'll do with you. If you need to make a public response, do it now. As together we stand and sing.